There have been medical breakthroughs and discovery and use of A1C, as we can see here. The how HbA1C was discovered, there have been many researchers which have contributed to our knowledge, finding out that HbA1C is elevated in patients with diabetes. Also, speaking about the fact that total HbA1C was introduced in the clinical laboratories as a tool for looking at diabetes. DCCD established HbA1C as a clinical endpoint. In 2010, HbA1C was validated as a diagnostic tool, uh, and that was the final thing in terms of the advances of HbA1C. But let's get back to the basic and understand what is glycation. So glycation is a non-enzymatic reaction redu between reducing sugars and protein-bound amines. All proteins in the body, including hemoglobin, are subject to glycation. Attachment of a molecule of glucose to the amino acid chain of the protein. As per the IFCC working group, glycated hemoglobin is defined as hemoglobin that is irreversibly glycated at one or both end terminal valines. This process is called the Maillard reaction. Initial phase in, of the Maillard reaction is still reversible where it forms a shift phase. And this is later on followed by a stable ketoamine linkage where it undergoes a amidory rearrangement to form an irreversible bond. HbA1c is larger, believed to be convenient and a reproducible marker of glycemia. WHO did recommend that A1c more than 6.5 can be used for the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and we'll come to that a little later, why this 6.5 and what was the strength behind that. It did include the caveat though that this is only if stringent quality assurance tests are in place. Assays are standardized to criteria aligned to international reference values and there are no conditions present that preclude its accurate measurement. And I must assure you that this was with the earnest uh, uh, principles of looking at HbA1c. Again, hopefully there has been no controversy as some may claim that HbA1c was used as a tool, uh, again, to, for somebody to make money in the industry. However, what determines HbA1c? There are, the routine peripheral blood A1c is, is based on three factors. The HbA1c in the reticular sites when they are released from the bone marrow, the synthetic rate of HbA1c, as RBCs become older, the function of the glucose concentration is getting attached to the protein in the hemoglobin. And finally, the mean age of RBCs in the circulation. So these are the three factors that your HbA1c depends on. Let's also understand the earlier old term glycated hemoglobin. Largely, we don't see that, but still some of the laboratories and centers in different parts of the world will still be measuring what is called as glycated hemoglobin. In glycated hemoglobin, you have the other sugars also as a part of it. The HbA1c, which is glucose specific, is about 60 to 80 percent of the glycated hemoglobin component. And then you have the other sugars attached to the non-end terminal sites like the fructose 1,6-diphosphate, glucose 6-phosphate and so on. So if you remember the old values where glycated hemoglobin used to be given, you, have, you used to have 6 to 8 percent as the normal range. And anything more than 8 would be considered abnormal, but today you know that the normal range is less than 5.7, 5.7 to 6.4 as pre-diabetes, and 6.5 more than which is for HbA1c and not the glycated hemoglobin as in the past. It's been proven beyond doubt in trials again like DCCT that there is a clear link between HbA1c and microvascular complications. With each increase in, in percentage in HbA1c, you have higher risk of retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. Now, conditions leading to falsely elevated, and this is important. All of us still consider HbA1c as the gold standard and use it on a routine basis. What are the conditions which lead to falsely elevated or low HbA1c? So, falsely high A1c's would be seen in iron deficiency and pernicious anemias. In fact, it's been reported that in anemia, Correction of anemia sometimes can reduce the HbA1c to the tune of 0.8 to 1 percent. And, and that's an issue especially in our country and I'll come to that. Various hemoglobinopathies may cause high, uh, 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 falsely high A1c. Kidney disease you can have again falsely high A1c and conditions of jaundice. <coughs> falsely low HbA1c in hemolysis, splenic sequestration, when patients are on hemodialysis, again some hemoglobinopathies, erythropoietin treatment, and so on. <coughs> Sorry. Can I have some water, please? Okay. Also some drugs we know. So aspirin at high doses can call falsely high A1C and chronic opioid use. Thank you. 
You can also have falsely low A1C again. Chronic alcohol use, aspirin at low dose. So understand this, aspirin at low dose makes it low. Aspirin at high dose, which is not used much, may push it up. Vitamin C and E. Now you've seen in a lot of prescription and this brings some thought. At least in the past I used to see that a lot of senior colleagues using a high dose of vitamin E and C in all anti-diabetic prescriptions as antioxidants. Now we really don't know. Patients on such high antioxidants were they having a falsely low HbA1c than what it would have been? And it would be interesting today to see that difference by doing CGM in, in, amongst these different group of patients. <coughs> How do we really interpret A1c in the presence of severe deficiency anemias? So HbA1c does depend on blood glucose and the RBC lifespan. I told you the initial three factors. RBC's lifespan does vary with anemia leading to a consequent alteration in the A1C value. So what essentially happens in iron deficiency anemia, there is more glycation. The lifespan of the red blood cell increases in, in presence of anemia. They are prone to more glycation. There is also presence of more uh, uh, melonaldehyde, which increases their glycation. So in such aspects of severe iron deficiency anemia, the lifespans increase more glycation and you get falsely high HbA1C. And as per the WHO definition, what is anemia? Hb less than 12 in females and less than 13 in males. And if you actually go back and see the data of your own clinics and hospital OPDs, significant number of your population with diabetes will fall into the anemia segment. There has been studies done by Bhargav et al. on the other hand, which have looked at the interference of anemia. At one point I spoke about how anemia may actually impact, but then they've gone on to say in the studies that though it may affect Actually, till an HB level of 5, it doesn't really have a clinical significance. So which again raises the question of how much is anemia really affecting the new assays of HbA1c. What about in presence of chronic kidney disease? Again, in chronic kidney disease, anemia is frequently observed. The etiology of anemia may be multifactorial. It could be by low erythropoietin production, chronic illness, and vitamin and iron deficiency. And hence, in patients with CKD, you may have altered uh, um, uh, HbA1c values. The third point I said was the RBC lifespan. So there is a wide belief that the RBC lifespan is stable for 120 days. When we speak about it, we remember our earlier training and RBC lifespan is 120 days. The assumption has been made that only hemolytic disease alters the RBC lifespan, but that's not true. The mean age of RBC, which can take account of different survival or in different subpopulations within an individual person's RBC, is actually a better determinant of the RBC lifespan. And contrary to the conventional wisdom, it may be a more common source of clinically important variation. So in a lot of conditions, the RBC lifespan will change, affecting the HbA1c value in that individual. What about race and ethnicity? Now, when you got that value of HbA1c as 6.5 as cutoff, you know, it's not that in every race it is the same value, but it is something which the WHO came as to a uniform value to give rather than saying that in Asians it should be 6.6, .6, in Africans it should be 6.3, in Caucasians it should be different. And that would have created more confusion across the world. But evidence does suggest that due to genetic differences in the erythrocyte metabolism, A1C levels may actually be higher in African Americans, Hispanics, and Asian population when compared to the white Caucasian population. Now these differences, again, although small, have uh, uh, found to contribute to the alterations in HbA1c. And the case here is of an African American male with A1c values in the pre-diabetes segment. Um, the A1c was actually found to be overestimating the dysglycemia based on the normal glucose values. And it would be postulated that the patient who was predisposed to elevated A1c potentially because of the race and age. And both these factors will bring about and show false high A1c. So, so remember that an aging individual and if an aging African American, you have an A1c of 6.7, you may not want to jump to conclusion and, and watch this patient more closely and monitor. Underestimation of dysglycemia. What may cause underestimation besides the earlier factors? Well, again, patients having HIV or having some lipodystrophies, you may see this false low HbA1c. Type 2 diabetes also may result from the HIV-related insulin resistance. Um, however, in such an individual where, who was HIV positive and they detected diabetes, the argument was that this, uh, the A1C 
um, the false low A1C could have been also associated with the use of antiretroviral drugs, the reverse nucleoside transcriptase inhibitors. And then finally, an aspect of glycation gap. The entire concept of glycated protein is based on the principle of glycation. And there are many uh, confounders in the human body where there could be glycation gaps either ways. You could be having negative glycation gap or you could be having a positive glycation gap again impacting the HbA1c. So though HbA1c is the gold standard and largely sacrosanct, it has its own limitations which we should be aware of uh, um, in a, on a scientific platform. Now what really does HbA1c represent, sir? The HbA1c also should be kept in mind that it represents a, a flux between the fasting and postprandial. And as Monier showed in his earlier paper and has been then looked upon by various other Asian studies as well, when the HbA1c is, is higher, closer to 10%, it is the fasting plasma glucose which is contributing almost 70 to 80% to that HbA1c value. As the HbA1c starts coming closer to what may be considered as target, closer to 8, 7.57, it's predominantly the postprandial sugar which contributes to the HbA1c. So it's not something which is uniform. Also, a lot of individuals may think that HbA1c represents the sugar over last three months. No. HbA1c is a weighted measure. So your last 30 days contribute almost 50 to 55 percent to that value. And the remaining two months contribute 50-55. Within that also there is data that the second month contributes almost 30 percent. The last month contributes 15 to 20 percent. So in a lot of clinical scenarios, when, in, when a clinician decides to do HbA1c for a patient in a six-week period, if the patient can afford it, it's fine because it is going to give you a value if it's going to change. It's going to be significant time to pick up that change, uh, whether positive or negative. Of course, it's also important in today's time to remember that patients with different HbA1c, uh, patients with same HbA1c's may have completely different profiles. So HbA1c does have its own limitation, and I will speak about that at the end. Quickly touching upon the point of uh, the ADAC study, which was the A1C derived average glucose. And this is important because we all use HbA1C and you tell your patients that your 7% means about 154, 155. Right? You have to because our patients understand values as 130, 140, 160. So the first time that a patient does HbA1C, you need to tell them what that correlates in your sugar. And you get those values. But how did you get those values? Were they same, similar earlier? No, they were not. So when they had, when Nathan and all looked at the ADAC study, they looked at 507 subjects, 268 with type 1, 159 with type 2, and some non-diabetics. They looked at the A1C at the three months, and they did multiple SMBG and some two-day CGMs. And this was early days, 2008. So you did have the Medtronic CGM available, but they could use it only for two days. So they did multiple CGMs in these individuals. Uh, to get to this equation, which gave them the value that average glucose, the A1C derived average glucose is 28.7 into your HbA1C percentage 7, 7.5, 8, 8.2, whatever, minus 46.7. And that gives you the value. This is the representational difference. When you talk about mean blood glucose, the earlier HbA1C correlative, correlative values were mean blood glucose. And you can understand here from the diagram that what, how the mean blood glucose was, was derived as compared to the average A1C derived average glucose based on the formula. And that's what gave you these current values. If you see in the past, your 7% A1C even at the time of at the time of DCCT would have been much higher, above 170. But today your 7% is, is 154. So we got these values after Nathan's effort as what was the ADAC study. Now moving on to methods of measuring HbA1c, there are many methods. The ion exchange chromatography is both low pressure and high pressure. The electrophoretic methods, chemical methods, mass spectroscopy, reverse phase HPLC and so on. What do we currently use HbA1c for? To monitor the long term glycemic control <coughs> for therapeutic decisions. Today. Is it possible for many of us to make therapeutic changes just based on a single fasting post-lunch or even at times just based on some SMBG? I think most of us would find it difficult without an HbA1c to make changes. Having said that, today many of us would find it difficult to make changes even without looking at a CGM beyond HbA1c and SMBG and I'll come to that. 
What about HbA1c for diagnosis of diabetes? Was this always there? No, this has been more in the recent years. They did realize that HbA1c re correlates strongly with microvascular complications, especially retinopathy. In 1997, the expert committee recommended against using A1c for diagnosis. At that point in time, HbA1c was not to be used for diagnosis. But later on, especially two important studies contributed to this changing, the NANS population study, which did find this, that somewhere between 5.8 and 6.2, closer to 6, 6.1, you were seeing an exponential rise in the incidence of retinopathy. Before that, the A1Cs lesser than that were not causing increase in microvascular complication. The DETECT2 study also saw that again, closer to the 6.6, 6.5 mark is where there is a rise between HbA1c levels and the incidence of microvascular complications. So both these studies contributed to the International Expert Committee report on the role of A1c for, as a tool for diagnosis of diabetes. And post July 2009, they recommended that HbA1c may be adopted as one of the diagnostic criteria for diabetes. So this was just about 13 years back. What really changed between 2003 and 2009? Earlier they were saying no, till 2003 they were saying no. Well, it was essentially the advances in instrumentation and standardization of the test, the accuracy and precision of A1C, uh, which led to the committee approving HbA1C as a tool for diagnosis. Now today there are new reference methods. You have the IFCC measure, which, which so-called they call it as the pure A1C value. It's expressed as millimoles per mole of hemoglobin. It's been around for a while, just to give you an idea. An HbA1c of 5 would be, the, would be equivalent to 33 millimoles per mole in the IFCC value. An A1c of 8 would be close to 58. Honestly, I've been seeing these values for last few years. I just can't get it fixed into my head. It has to be the percentage for me. If somebody gives me an IFCC value, I can't translate it. But in certain parts of the world, they are using this more regularly as the reference value. Why HbA1c may be a stronger tool for diagnosis than just your blood sugar or your you know, fasting and postprandial? Because there are pitfalls even with glucose measurement. The measurement of glucose itself at times can be less accurate. 41% of the instruments used may have a significant bias from the reference method and that led in the past in a study for about 12% patients in that particular study as being misclassified. There could be potential pre-analytical errors uh, related to sample handling. And liability of glucose in the tubes, you know that they have to be collected in the fluoride tubes and so on. And sometimes that liability itself may lead to problems. The advantage of HbA1c on, on the other hand, well, it's stable after collection. The new reference method adds strength to the assay. The coefficient of variation has been so shown to be substantially lower for the HbA1c. And the variability of A1c is also considerably less than that of a fasting plasma glucose value. It's convenient for the patient and ease of, uh, ease of the sample collection. We know that it doesn't require any fasting or postprandial. Any time of the day you can do an HbA1c. And it's relatively unaffected by an acute event, what you ate today, your fever, your stress, and so on. Some practical considerations, again, when you understand about HbA1c, that POC instruments, which are extremely popular, I use them also at my clinic, but there's a caveat that do not probably use them as a tool for diagnosis. And if you do, always try and confirm that from a laboratory test. It can be a good screening method. It may be a great method for monitoring your patients because they don't go to the laboratory. They do some SMBG. You can do it as a point of care at home. But avoid using it as a diagnostic tool. And there are many a point of care instruments. There are four listed here, but there are many more in the, in, in, in the market now. What about which would be the best method for HbA1c? And largely, HbA1c should be considered the gold standard, though there are better methods which are used for research studies, the electrospay ionophoresis, which is right up there. And then the point of care is at the bottom in terms of its reproducibility and accuracy, but yet practically relevant. So the 2010 consensus statement on the worldwide standardization of HbA1c measurement, that HbA1c test results should be standardized worldwide, the IFCC reference system for A1C represents the only valid anchor to implement standardization and hence that entire millimole per molecule, uh, uh, per millimole per mole drive. 
HB1C results are to be reported by clinical laboratories worldwide in the SI units, which is millimole per mole, and also, thankfully for, for backward people like us, in the derived NGSP percentage units. If they started reporting only in millimoles per mole, it will take, it will create more confusion in countries like ours and, and, and will lead to further stress for many. Now, there are, of course, daily fluctuations in the sugar, and we were talking about the earlier paper that patients with the same A1C may have different profiles. And that's true. There are a lot of fluctuations on a day-to-day -day basis. Will that impact HbA1c? Is there really uh, the fact that two people with A1c 7 would be having the same profile? And look at the word of, words of wisdom from Peacock way back in 1984. We weren't aware of CGM. CGM here in the bracket I have added. What was said then, back then in 1984, HbA1c and mean glucose corroborate abnormal glucose metabolism, but it requires self-monitoring to detect the location and magnitude of the abnormalities. I've, of course, added CGM because it's going to add a better picture. HbA1c and SMBG should be considered together. I will go on to say HbA1c and SMBG and, and CGM today should be considered together for the complete information. Finally, let me end by just showing um, if the slide is clearly visible, I'm not sure, that this is an individual who's been seeing me at the clinic. And the HbA1c on, on respective visits was 7% and 6.0%. But at every visit, the individual sugar values would come high, 253, 279, 236, 261. <clears throat> but the HbA1c bang normal. What do you do when a patient comes to you with high <coughs> individual readings and a normal HbA1c? You may think either the HbA1c is falsely low or is the sugar falsely high. How do you differentiate? So that is where, again, the strength of CGM comes in for such an individual was subjected to CGM, showing us the profile that the patient's sugars are genuinely high. Forget the estimated A1c. We know we don't have to rely on that. That this patient, HbA1c, for some reason, was coming falsely low all the time. This patient was one of those variants. But the patient's genuine sugars are on the higher side. You see the fasting, it's closer to 160, 170. You see the post-lunch, it is closer to 200, 220. So there would be times where the HbA1c and your individual readings would vary. A CGM would be the best means of picking this up. So with that, let me end and, 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 and hand it back to the chairperson for any questions on this topic.